Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Nancy Netzer, inaugural Robert L. and Judith T. Winston Director of the McMullen Museum and Professor of Art History at Boston College. And I want to welcome you, members of the McMullen Museum and lenders and contributors to our current exhibition, to the members virtual lecture for the Lost Generation, Women Ceramicists, and the Cuban Avant-Garde. This exhibition marks the seventh organized by the McMullen Museum as part of its Hispanic Art Initiative. And once again, the idea for the exhibition was proposed to the McMullen team by Elizabeth Thompson Goitsueta, who taught Hispanic studies and Latin American and Peninsular art, culture, and literature at Boston College until her retirement two years ago. And once again, the exhibition breaks new ground, this time by expanding the canon to include the little explored, women-dominated medium of mid 20th century Cuban artistic ceramics. Professor Goitsueta has assembled from an array of galleries and private collections an outstanding selection of ceramics produced in the Talier de Santiago de Las Vegas in Cuba. The workshop was owned and directed by a multi talented physician. Juan Miguel Rodriguez de la Cruz. Goitsueta has studied for the first time the relationship of the ceramics to the paintings and sculptures by Cuba's second and third generation modernists. The most well-known Vanguardia painters and sculptors were men. But as the exhibition demonstrates, the women ceramicists contributed equally to the development of the artistic innovations of the Vanguardia movement. As curator, Professor Goitsueta pursued this project tirelessly, selecting the works, obtaining the loans throughout the Americas and Spain, devising the installation's narrative and editing and contributing to the catalog. Her keen eye, mastery of Cuban art, consistent calm, unfailing optimism, and human kindness have got have inspired everyone participating in the project. In addition to herself, Professor Goitsueta also assembled outstanding contributors to the exhibition's catalog, who are with us today on this Zoom. Emeritus Professor of Art History and Latin American Studies at William Patterson University, Alejandro Andreas, curator of the Cuban avant-garde and the Wifredo Lam collections at the National Museum of Fine Arts in Havana, Roberto Cobas Amate, and Carol Damian, Emeritus Professor of Art History at Florida International University. Mining the archives and the extant ceramics and paintings, these scholars probed the complex relationship between the avant-garde in the two mediums, revealing previously unexamined connections among the practices of the 26 artists in the exhibition. We also extend special thanks to Aaron Goodman and Cesar Perez, who translated all the catalog and exhibition texts. The project was greatly aided by Enrique Rodriguez Perez and Eslady Sanchez Moreno. Ambassador Jeffrey and Jennifer De Laurentiis and the Cuban Heritage Collection at the University of Miami Libraries. It goes without saying that this exhibition would not have been possible without its generous lenders, many of whom are joining us from afar today on this Zoom. So thank you very much. 
as always, a devoted and talented team at Boston College contributed to the project from beginning to end. Diana Larson, an assistant director at the McMullen, worked closely with Thompson Goitsueda to design the magnificent installation which focuses attention on the complex relationships among the avant-garde ceramicists, painters, and sculptors. Our other assistant director, John McCoy, has designed the beautiful bilingual catalog, the website, and the signage for the exhibition to evoke the Cuban mid-century modernist aesthetic. The museum's manager of publications and exhibitions, Kate Shugart, worked di diligently as editor-in-chief of the catalog. She also organized all of the loans and photography of the objects and wrote many of the exhibition's didactic texts. And Rachel Chamberlain, manager of education, outreach, and digital resources, aided by the McMullen student ambassadors and docents, has devised and organized a variety of both in-person and virtual public programs to engage a wide audience. Our erudite museum docents, chaired by Sharon Bazarian, also deserve a shout out for mastering the conceptual framework of the exhibition to share with visitors to offer both in-person and virtual tours of the exhibition. And please visit our website to get more information about both the in-person and virtual tours. Finally, this ambitious project could not have been realized without the backing of the administration of Boston College and the McMullen Family Foundation. We thank especially Jacqueline McMullen. Major support for the exhibition was provided by Boston College, the patrons of the McMullen Museum, chaired by C. Michael Daly, and the McMullen Museum's Hispanic Art Initiative. And now it's my pleasure to turn over the screen to our speaker, Elizabeth Thompson Goitsueda, to whom we owe our greatest debt of gratitude. She will speak for about 35 minutes and then take questions. If you have questions or comments, please put them in the chat. And now please join me in congratulating and thanking Professor Elizabeth Thompson Goitsueda as I turn over the screen to her. Thank you so much, Nancy. I appreciate that lovely introduction and buenos dias, eh, bienvenidos todos. Good morning on this very uh, ugly Boston morning. <laughs> we have snow and slush. And so we're going to uh, really brighten your day here with some of these ceramics. I'm on the uh, third floor. I'm in the Monin Gallery. And behind me, you can see some of the ceramics uh, right over this shoulder. You can see some of the women's ceramics and kind of, if you look and cast your eyes down, uh, behind me, you can see maybe some some paintings from our uh, Vanguardia Cuban artists. So I'm going to share my screen. So overlooked in the annals of Cuban art history, a generation of women artists helped inspire and create an extraordinary period of mid-century modernism in that country. This is the tale of El Taller de Santiago de Las Vegas, a ceramics factory on the outskirts of Havana in a small town whose name it bore and of an innovative and prescient proprietor, a retired physician cum ceramicist. So here you see him in the middle, if you look at the screen, and of course he's surrounded by these women ceramicists. And here you see another shot of him, Juan Miguel Rodriguez de la Cruz. He's stoking a coal kiln at the taller and this photo was taken about uh sometime between 1950 and 1954. it's one of my favorite uh shots of uh El senor rodriguez de la cruz because he reminds me a bit of picasso here you know in his work 
Most remarkably, however, it is the historical narrative of a collective of women artists who galvanized the modern artistic ceramic movement from 1949 to about 1959, and by extension, the third generation of the avant-garde in Cuba. So this is a picture you're seeing here of our uh, the opening, the introductory wall for our exhibition. The exhibition, The Lost Generation, Women's Ceramicists and the Cuban Avant-Garde, now on view at the McMullen Museum of Art at Boston College, is a deep dive into that tale. It describes how these young women, many of whom, whom were graduates of Havana's prestigious art institute, Academia San Alejandro, emerged toward the end of the 1940s, seeking employment in a post-World War II society. These women graduates of San Alejandro, economically disenfranchised and without means to fund private studios or galleries, turned to ceramics, not only as a means of support, but also as a means of exploration and creativity. Theirs was not the spiritual or emotional wasteland of the post-World War I society known as the lost generation, a term coined by 20th century artist and critic Gertrude Stein, referring to those disillusioned writers and artists who flocked to Paris. That generation unloaded their psyches onto the literary and artistic movements. The generation in Cuba emerging from World War II similarly found themselves affected by their government's allegiance to allied forces. There was a similar burgeoning phenomenon of literary and artistic creativity, but the wasteland was not spiritual or emotional. It was and remains historical, one in which these women's ceramicist names are completely absent from the roll call of Cuban modernism. So I wanted to stop here and just point out some of the uh, people that we have in the show. And of course, you've here is uh, is Senor Juan Miguel Rodriguez de la Cruz, completely clothed. Um, we'll see a lot of the shots of him in the ephemera. I think it was between the heat and that colkin that made him bare chested often. Um, this is his wife, uh, Dulce Escalona. And then here you have the great Amelia Pelaez, who was a painter and then became a ceramicist. And behind her, you can barely make out is one of the ceramicists that will be um, featuring in our exhibition, Mirta Garcia Buc. Uh, down here, we have uh, Rebecca Robes here and Marta Arjona. And here we have the esteemed Cuban painter and ceramicist. So he got his start at the Taller de Santiago de Las Vegas with Fredo Lam. This is in 1950. We are not able to identify this couple here nor are we able to identify the children. But one of the things that's very interesting is that children were welcomed. And uh, I think that kind of solved the perennial question that many women have about daycare and what to do with their children. So it was a very open environment. So at as institutions and academics and the public demand more attention to and interest in Latin American and Caribbean marginalized artists, it is urgent that this lacuna at the very least be examined and addressed. These women's ceramic contributions influenced and determined Cuban designs now defined as avant-garde. And here you'll see some of the initial nucleus of the women. The exhibit explores the reasons for this historical absence and resurrects the names and personal contributions of these female artists to the modern Cuban movement and, by extension, that of the larger canon of the Americas as well. It does not attempt to promote the inclusion of these women artists into the 20th century canon solely based on their gender. Instead, the exhibit asks the questions, how do we evaluate their ceramics? How do we consider their contributions, especially in cases of scant production? For example, we only have one example of this woman, Elia Rosa Fernandez de Mendia. 
in our exhibition, although there are many. Uh, she was a very accomplished ceramicist. What were the intentions upon embarking on, on these designs? And under what rubric do we assess their position in history? Perhaps these questions can provide the catalyst and intellectual instruments to probe basic assumptions and arrive at a more robust discussion of the Cuban modernist movement and modernism in general. For many of these inquiries and their implications extend beyond the borders of Cuba. And here you'll see one of the uh, collective plates that we have in the exhibit, where we have examples of the uh, of the women's ceramicists uh, motifs of fish that they contributed to. And it's a wonderful example to have this uh, plate, which was done in a very kind of a playful mood. But there is also another tale. It is a tale within a tale which is linked to this augmented discussion on 20th century modernism. It hovers on the margins of the main thrust of this exhibition, which is the scholarly narrative, yet perhaps considers the exhibit from a more philosophical lens by asking, why should we care? This lecture will explore that question. To do so, we will begin with the origins of this exhibition and thus, I return to the tale within the tale. In December 2019, the National Museum of Fine Arts Havana hosted in its auditorium the debut in Cuba of a new bilingual documentary, Into the Light, Hacia la Luz, spotlighting one of the most important members of the third generation of Cuban modernism, Rafael Soriano from 1920 to 2015. And here you see a wonderful 1950s photo of him. Soriano's works are in the National Museum's permanent collection and on display in their Vanguardia Wing, an ample gallery dedicated to those artists, most of whom you will find in the current Macmillan exhibition, who belonged and contributed to the last decade of Cuban modernism, the 1950s. This is the decade in which ceramics became a medium of modernist artistic expression. This decade was bookended by two principal artistic movements. The first was called Los Once, or the Eleven, appeared at the beginning of the decade and was known for its natural organic interpretation of abstraction. And the second, Los Diez, appeared at the very end of the decade and was known for its more cerebral and geometric interpretation. And I refer now to this wonderful photograph that we have of a joint exhibition uh, with Agustin Cárdenas and Rafael Soriano at the Universidad de La Habana in 1955. And if you can look closely, you can see that Agustin Cárdenas is the sculptor and he executed these beautiful organic sculptures. So of course, since they are natural in form and take inspiration from nature, this, he would have been a member of Los Once. But if you peer beyond those sculptures into the wall behind them, you can see these wonderful geometric abstract uh, works by Rafael Soriano. And if you look at this painting here, it is the painting that we have in the prior slide. So it's uh, it's a wonderful way to kind of examine what was going in, going on in the fifties with these two kind of competing um, interpretations of abstraction, and while the uh, organic was waning, the geometric uh, towards the end of the decade was waxing. So the documentary inclu included an extensive and scholarly examination of both movements with an emphasis, of course, on geometric or concrete abstraction, given that Soriano was one of its pioneering members. What clearly emerged from the documentary was the importance of the 1950s, these movements and their impact on the artistic world. Most significantly, it demonstrated the importance of the dialogue between modernism in Cuba and abstraction in the Americas, both Latin and North America, the Caribbean and Europe. 
And I refer here now to this wonderful group photo of uh, the third generation artists. And in the middle, of course, you see Rafael Soriano. To the far left, you see Roberto Diago, Lolo Sol de Villa, who uh, was a cultural ambassador to Paris, returned to Cuba in uh, 1959 and helped to start this third generation by opening and promoting uh, these artists in her gallery. And then here you hear, you see Escobedo, Sandu Darie, and of course, our old friend Wifredo Lam, uh, who was the subject of an exhibition that we had here at the McMullen in 2014. As the curator of the Rafael uh, Soriano Artist as Mystic, which opened at the McMullen Museum in 2017 and traveled to several venues, I was invited to participate on the panel in Havana, along with Soriano's only child, Hortensio Soriano, and the documentary director, David Schler. Following the premiere, I was approached by an individual from the audience who claimed to have an outstanding ceramics collection by major Cuban vanguardia artists, Wifredo Lam, Mariano, René Portocarrero, Luis Martinez Pedro, Wifredo Arcai, Raul Milian, among others. And here we have another photograph of some of those artists. Now this individual invited me on the spot to see his collection. Side note, since I'm married to a Cuban and accustomed to a certain degree of hyperbole in Cuban claims and rhetoric, I immediately declined the offer. To be fair, I am not the only person to observe this phenomenon. Indeed, award-winning Cuban author uh, Anna Menendez's book, In Cuba, I Was a German Shepherd, and here you see the cover of that book, speaks to the frequency of Cubans' tendency towards magnification. Not to be dissuaded, the individual pressed his phone number into my palm in case I changed my mind. Through art connections and scholarly relationships in Cuba, I discovered that this individual did indeed have a magnificent ceramics collection. So there's a second side note here. An apology is due to the individual and to all Cubans in general. I set out a couple of days later to meet with the collector and his wife in their home in Havana. I was astounded when I walked into the living room and found ceramics artfully displayed throughout the house. Thankfully, their baby was not yet ambulatory and confined to a, a crib. As we began to admire the works, we viewed creative, colorful, and innovative examples of painted ceramics now in our exhibition. We began to examine and comment on the pieces which true to the collector's claim were by the major participants in Cuba's vanguardia, Porto Carrero, Luis Martinez Pedro, Lam, Mariano, Milian, etc. I was astounded by the symmetry observed in their two-dimensional works. There was Lam's changos and aviary dragons, and you can see that here in the slide. There was Mariano's maritime themes, and you can see on the right, we have his fisherman from 1950. And then on the left, we have this beautiful ceramic, same theme. Porto Carrero's cathedrals and Madonnas. And you can see this here on the left and on the right. And Martinez Pedro's abstractions. But other remarkable pieces caught my attention all of which displayed a freshness and boldness of design with which I was unfamiliar, as was I equally unfamiliar with the artist's names. Here you can see a beautiful ceramic bowl. And one of the things that I wanna draw your attention to would be this beautiful perforations that you have here and this curvy linear, this neck, which is very original, in addition to the colors that are used uh, another one that I saw was this beautiful uh, bowl, this vase that has the uh, very iconic hibiscus flower in its center, but in very subdued tones with uh, indentations in the middle, um, showing circles and squares and rhombuses. And also one of our favorites here at the gallery is Mirta Garcia Buch's Fishman flower pot 
And uh, I love the way the creativity and the ingenuity behind uh, this expression. A single or a couple or even a handful of unrecognizable names could be understandable. But after curating three Cuban exhibitions spanning all generations of modernism and five Latin American exhibitions, how was it possible that I had not heard of nine names of artists that were producing such innovative designs? The answer, they were all women. I immediately sensed that this would be a wonderful exhibition, one that would elevate the works, the medium, and their creators equally. My daughter, art historian Gabriela Goizueta, who specializes in Latin and North American, modern and contemporary art, has been encouraging me for some time to embark on an exhibition focused on women, a gap I eagerly sought to fill. Unfortunately, art historians are aware of few women artists in the Cuban modernist movement. These few, such as Amelia Palaez, here we see her work, Carmen Herrera, Noloso de Villa, Zilia Sanchez have already been subjects of well-deserved solo exhibitions. Amelia Pelaez was at the Perez Art Museum in 2014. Lolo Sol de Villa at the Sean Kelly Gallery in New York City in 2019. Herrera at the Whitney in 2017 and Sanchez at the Phillips Collection in Washington in 2019. International scholars, institutions, and the public are now beginning to recognize Cuban contemporary female artists, such as Ana Mendieta, Magdalena Campos Pons, who has a show up currently in, in Brooklyn at the museum, Tanya Bruguera, who is now here in Boston with us at Harvard, and Belkis Allion. Here's a shot of Belkis Allion's, uh, one of her works that was featured at the Venice Biennale in 2022. At long last, there's an increasing attention devoted to the female artists and writers of Cuban modernism. In addition to those modernists already mentioned, we should recognize art patroness Maria Luisa Gomez Mena. Here she is in front of her gallery. Furniture designer Clara Porset, anthropologists and writers Lydia Cabrera, Natalia Bolivar, and Julia Rodriguez Tomeo. Nonetheless, the list is limited. In modernist Cuba, women experience disadvantages based on economics, gender, and culture, even while accessing special institutional structures, such as San Alejandro, the Arts Academy. Certain cultural institutions in Cuba did allow women to participate, not only participate, but promote women and their concerns. Women artists participated in solo and joint exhibitions along with their male counterparts. In February and March 1959, the Liceum or the Lyceum, an influential women's cultural and social organization in Havana, mounted two significant exhibitions. The first, Arte para Oriente, Art for the Oriente Province, highlighted paintings and sculptures by artists for the Universidad de Oriente in Santiago de Cuba and it included works by Luis Martinez Pedro, Jose Maria Mijares, Mirta Garcia Buch, Mariano Rodriguez, Amele Peláez, René Portocarrero, Julio Herrera Zapata, and Roberto Stopinian, all of whom we have in our exhibit at the McMullen. The second, Trece Artistas Cubanas in el Liceo, 13 Cuban women artists at the Lyceum commemorated the 30th anniversary of its founding by journalist, suffragist, and feminist Berta Arocena de Martinez Marquez. It featured ceramics, paintings, and sculptures by taller artists Rebecca Robes Maces, Mirta Garcia Buch, Amelia Peláez, and Ofelia San, among others. Also included was sculptor Agustin Cárdenas. These two Lyceum exhibitions are loosely recreated today by some of the works of these artists in the Monin Gallery on the third floor of the McMullen Museum, which is where I am today. And before I pass to the next screen, this is a wonderful shot of the sculptor Agustin Cárdenas, who is working on a ceramics relief. 
So here you can see the recreation. If you look closely, you can see we have some of the exact same ceramics in our show. And so we are displaying them in the same order. So we're delighted to have that. Now, why are most art historians then ignorant of the women in this avant-garde collective? Is our ignorance due to the exclusion from broader structures of influence in Cuban society? Or is it due to the intervention of the Cuban revolution or a combination of those factors? With the arrival of the 1959 revolution, the factory was repurposed. The, the industrial sector would now provide economic financing for the support of the revolution. Political considerations shape, let me go back. Political considerations shape social and cultural realities. For Cuban modernism, the revolution was an inflection point. Abstract and modernist expressions were at times tolerated, but at best met with suspicion. Many artists left. Some stayed, including Porto Carrero. And this is his beautiful mural inside uh, La Habana Hilton, the hotel. And the bar is called Las Cañitas. So it's a wonderful example of, to see how ceramics grew to include these large displays, interior displays. And Pelaez, here is her untitled mural, which graces the outside facade of the Hotel Habana Hilton. But the ceramics movement production and influence was now understood through an altered lens. What we now know is there have been great Cuban women ceramicists in addition to Meli Pelais, and they deserve recognition. They should not remain a lost generation. Thus, the central question of this lecture is, why is it important, indeed fundamental, to recognize these women artists as part of the Cuban modernist movement? If we value art based on merit, without modern art relying on the pronouncements of critics, then we must consider the singular achievements of these women artists, along with the third generation accomplishments and recognition afforded their great male peers. In her book, The Story of Art Without Men, Katie Hessel takes aim at the greatness factor, arguing that there's nothing inherently different about work created by artists of any particular gender. It is that, and I quote, society and its gatekeepers have always prioritized one group in history, end quote. She expounds convincingly on amending the injustice by adding women to the canon. Quote, artists pinpoint moments of history through a uniquely expressive medium and allow us to make sense of a time. If we aren't seeing art by a wide range of people, we aren't really seeing society, history, or culture as a whole. Hessel's book, as she explains in the introduction, is in direct response to Linda Nochlin's pivotal 1971 scholarly essay, Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists? Written in the second wave of the feminist movement. A primary goal of the Nochlin essay was to change or displace the traditional, almost entirely male-oriented notion of greatness itself. In the essay, Nochlin debunks the theory of male greatness or genius artists. And what about Cuban women artists? Or, rephrasing Linda Nochlin's question for the purposes of this essay, why are there no great women ceramicists? As a female collective, the notion of greatness is diluted and still further is diluted still further by the parameters of the male individualistic culture within which greatness has traditionally been defined. Does the fact that women often work in collectives interfere with the notion of greatness as identified with the autonomous, self-sufficient, artistic genius ensconced in the solitude of his atelier? Is individual solitude a prerequisite for creative greatness? Or can such greatness also be the product of collaboration. Nochlin's reaction to these hypothetical questions would be based on a steely-eyed consideration of the question of equality, reduced to a realistic, if challenging, response. 
What is important is that women face up to the reality of their history and of their present situation without making excuses or puffing mediocrity. Disadvantage may indeed be an excuse. It is not, however, an intellectual position. Rather, using as a vantage point their situation as underdogs in the realm of grandeur and outsiders in that ideology, women can reveal institutional and intellectual weaknesses in general, and at the same time that they destroy false consciousness, take part in the creation of institutions in which clear thought and true greatness are challenges open to any one man or woman courageous enough to take the necessary risk, the leap into the unknown. Artistic analysis is not limited simply to outward critique, but requires an artist's inward reflection as well. In our case, as demonstrated in this essay, many of the Cuban women ceramicists faced up to their realities, abdicating careers as artists in favor of other paths. So here, here we see the, um, the young Marta Arjona, and here we see her as the older Marta Arjona, president of the National Board of Cultural Patrimony, and she worked for the creation and preservation of museums in Cuba. Yet for those who continue to produce works of art that equaled or surpassed the works created by the male avant-garde, a renewed consideration of the Cuban second and third generations of the avant-garde is demanded. More importantly, correction is in order. To view these women simply as fellows from San Alejandro fits into Hessel's argument that women have long been seen as the wife of, the muse of, the model of, or the acquaintance of great male artists. And here I show you a fabulous image of Francoise Gillot. Uh, Francoise Gillot was known as the partner, muse, and mother of Picasso's children, but she was also an accomplished artist in her own right and the subject of an exhibition at the McMullen Museum in the year 2000. Nochlin, in her follow-up essay, Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists 30 Years After, Women Artists at the Millennium, 2006, acknowledges institutional advances, but suggests a long road still ahead. Nonetheless, she does not argue for blind inclusion as a retroactive justification. Quote, I do not conceive of a feminist art history as a positive approach to the field, a way of simply adding a token list of women painters, sculptors to the canon. In 1986, third generation modernist Pedro de Ora described Amelia Pelaez as one of the most relevant personalities of our contemporary visual arts. He enhanced his description of Amelia with this poetic accolade. Espejo de agua brillante, cuyo vivo rumor todos escucharán. Reflection of sparkling water, whose deep murmur all will hear. And the murmur she imparts has a prescient tone. If the characteristics regarded as common to our Cuban painters are not yet recognized, they should be in the near future. Hopefully, these common characteristics will not be limited by traditional notions of greatness. May the annals of Cuban art history soon include the extraordinary contributions of Cuban women artists. Thank you so much. Well, Elizabeth, we thank you for being courageous enough to take the leap. And it's so clear that you have brought these women ceramicists back to life in the public forum so that they can be forgotten no more. Uh, what a wonderful introduction to a splendid exhibition. And we at the McMullen and at Boston College uh, applaud you and thank you uh, for giving us the opportunity to work with you on this very important exhibition. 
Thank you so much, Nancy. And I appreciate the McMullen support, the patron support, my lenders, everybody. It's been really a collaborative effort that is not just from me. Well, and this is certainly, I mean, I, I especially want to give a shout out to the patrons because they are the ones who make these exhibitions happen. And we're so grateful to them. And they've been with us a long time and they're very devoted to you and your and your research and to the research of all of our faculty. So um, thank you all to the patrons who are who are on this call today, especially and to everyone else on the McMullen team who contributes to making our exhibitions what they are. So I, there's loads of stuff in the chat here. And um, I. Um, I've got one to sort through and see where the questions are. Um, there's a lot, there are lots of people who have um, registered their appreciation for the talk, think it's wonderful. Um, and I'm just trying to pull up uh, any questions that are here. And perhaps what I should do, because I don't see them, is um, is maybe maybe I should just open um, open the floor to anyone who wants to ask a question, um, and maybe you can unmute yourselves and um, and ask directly. Ah, uh, yes, Phyllis, I see you have your hand up. No, excuse me, I didn't. I was just, that was to my dog. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, so I have a hand raised by uh, Simon Mary. Um... Thank you very much. I think that will go for now. Okay. Yeah. So for apologies, I came a little bit late. Okay. Thank you for the presentation. It was just lovely. Uh, it got me thinking also about the continent of Africa. The same thing you bring up is the same reality of the continent. Uh, the African context, uh, women were very central to uh, aesthetics, the preservation of aesthetics and the passing on of it because it had a religio-cultural dimension to it. And then we find that since uh, colonial times, women were completely erased from that reality. Uh, I'm particularly curious about how your research also looks at, I know you're talking, looking at it at, from a gender perspective, but is there uh, an economic, a racial perspective also? Because we see this not only in Latin America or in the Americas, it became a global phenomenon of erasure. So, but it particularly, uh, at least in the context of Africa, it eventually was or solidified within the context of colonial rule. Mm. Uh, and so I'm curious if your research expands to those, those uh, trajectories as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simon, Mary. Um, I appreciate that question so much because yes, I did focus on gender here, but two points I wanna make is that I started off uh, with the idea to present a women's uh, exhibition and it ended up being a collaborative exhibition with women and men, because I don't think you can separate the women's contributions from the men because they invited the men into the workshop. They invited the men, they taught them how to do their ceramics. And so there was this confluence and the symbiotic kind of relationship that really came together to define ceramics, whether it was male or female artists, of, of that decade of the 1950s. But you touch on a point which is very important. It is not just a gender issue, it is an economic issue. So if we go back in time and we think a little bit of what was happening in 1949, we know that World War II had just finished in 1945. And of course, a lot of these women had graduated. There was now increased demand for ceramics as a direct result of World War II because they could no longer import ceramics from Japan and Europe. And so they were able to actually um, look to their own creators to develop their own ceramics. So that was kind of why there was a profusion at this particular point in time. But these women graduating from the San Alejandro Academy 
were often not as economically um, advantaged as some of their male counterparts. So some of the male counterparts were able to graduate, open up their own galleries, travel the world, become renowned, and then it kind of snowballs. Once their names are known, then they can they get money, and then they're able to afford more time in the in the studios. And the women were not able to do that. These were women who had economic disadvantages. They graduated from San Alejandro Academy and they had to work for their living. And so they were fortunate to come across this physician, cum ceramicist, who became the sole owner in 1949 of this taller, of this workshop. And he needed to have workers that he could pay. So it was mutually advantageous for both of them. He couldn't hire, let's say, a Wifredo Lam to come in who had already made his name in Europe as a great Cuban modernist and a great modernist and surrealist. He had to hire people fresh out of uh, the academy. And these women were so talented that they began experimenting creatively on their own. And uh, El Señor Rodriguez de la Cruz saw their work and said, wow, this is fabulous, and he encouraged them to continue their experimentations and their creations. So there definitely was a, a gender component, but it was directly linked to an economic component, you know, not only of the time of the decade, but of the individual. So, um, so that kind of explains a little bit, I think, your question. Elizabeth, can you say something really about what happens after 1959? Because their work was really hidden after that point, and that may be an added difference um, to what Simon Mary had to say. Yes. Well, of course, you know, um, the revolution came, the Cuban Revolution in 1959, and this was kind of at the apex and the zenith of the ceramic movement. So the two uh, exhibitions that I was talking about in the lecture are loosely created in this gallery that I'm in right now. And that was in February and March of 1959, the year of the revolution. But as I mentioned in the lecture, uh, as the revolution kind of defined itself and evolved, it came to exclude abstraction. It really was not fond of abstraction as its, as its aesthetic uh, interpretation. And so it moved towards other uh, means of expression, artistic expression. And so the interesting question, I think, Nancy, that points that I think you're trying to get at is, do we not know of these women precisely because of the historical context? Or I think the research seems to indicate that they were known in their time. They were, in 1959, they were exhibiting with the men and they were equal to the men and regarded as colleagues and, and equal collaborators in the aesthetic movement uh, of the 1950s. So the question then becomes, is it history that has forgotten these people? Because once the revolution came through, it uh, not only did not embrace abstraction, but the taller itself, the workshop itself, uh, as a result of being an arm of the government, uh, reversed its focus from aesthetic ceramics to industrial wares, which they could then sell to support the revolution. So there's that uh, added complexity. So, but I think that what has happened, my research seems to indicate that it's history that has forgotten these women. And those factors are probably a combination of the factors that I've just explained. Simon Mary, I see you put something else in. Do you want to um, do you want to share that too? Because that was yeah, very yeah. Sorry, I, I think she, uh, Dr. Gozueta just touched briefly on that. I, I'm just thinking of the I call it the fallicization of art in the history of humanity of humanity, uh, or at least current history. And I see that in Africa also because they had to in the struggle for independence. They had to, art was no longer just beauty, it was now a weaponized tool of resistance. And then also there's the cultural bias that men are supposed to lead 
society in society. And so then they had to make art no longer this, I call it the queerness of its expression, but it now became a male reality. I don't know if that you might have already said that because I came in a little bit late, but I was curious if that played out also in Cuba. Yes, thank you. Yeah, we did touch on that a little bit. Um, but um I think what was interesting is that when the revolution, the 1959 revolution came through, um, it kind of finished off this opportunity to really weaponize or to use ceramics as a as a means to, of dissent or as a means of of uh, a different expression because they were kind of cut off at the knees. They couldn't kind of now um, it, neither the male artist nor the female artists, they couldn't actually um, use the workshop and this camaraderie and this collective force uh, to continue to produce ceramics in a collective way. What they did as a so sort of form of resistance was open their own individual workshops. So they continued to manufacture. And we do have plates from 1985 here in the exhibit. We have 1960s so we do show post revolutionary ceramics but it just is to suggest that the movement itself was kind of impaired and and really cut to its knees and if you did want to create ceramics and continue to create ceramics there was an opportunity to do so in the workshop but it, i think two percent of the production was was now uh restricted to aesthetic reproductions and 98% was was uh, for industrial uh, commercialization. So you can see by those statistics that that's, you know, it, it did continue. Uh, it was still recognized up until 1985, but then after that, it, it kind of disappeared. Thank you. I mean, we have three more questions in the chat now, which I'll share, and then maybe we'll let you go. Oh, happy uh, this one from Nina Schneider, one of our docents. Um, and she asks, how have post-1959 art and ceramics in Cuba continued to be influenced by themes and motifs of the third generation, if at all? Yes. Well, I mean, great question. Thank you, Nina. I would say that the, um, the exhibit itself, post-1959, um, and this kind of relates to the question that Simon Mary was talking about. Um, it did continue. It did flourish. I think if you look at the art that uh, has continued to uh, come out of Cuba, especially with regard to the 60s and the 70s, so during the initial stages of the revolution, you know, we have fabulous art being created. So what is the connection? I am arguing that the connection is, is inherent to these women ceramicists and the men ceramicists and the three generations of Cuban modernism, because you can see that richness in design continue to proliferate in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And there have been many exhibitions, and this comes back to Simon Mary's question, many exhibitions uh, that kind of look at the resistance art that then developed in a formal way in the 80s, in the 90s, by some of the great artists that are in many of the biennales and internationally recognized. So the modernist movement per se, which ended in 1959 with the revolution, doesn't mean that people stop painting. It means that the Cuban artists continued to paint, but more often they continued to paint in a way which was either in line with the goals of the revolution, or if it wasn't like in consistent with that, it was more in a resistance mode, which they would do in their own ateliers and their own studios and their own workshops, which were beginning to become recognized outside of Cuba and offered them a sort of protection. Um, but but certainly, for example, um, Antonia Riz, who was a painting in 1965, she painted some very stark, uh, resistant 
uh, paintings, and she was pretty much silenced for a while uh, and was unable to continue painting. Um, so you were either ostracized. Uh, we have El Caso Padillo, which is a movie, a documentary, which is coming out, which is kind of examining what happened to the artists, uh, literary and artistic artists who did not fall in to lockstep with the communist regime, which had by then declared itself communist. So um, I think the importance of this movement is to show that there was strength in numbers, there was strength in the collective, there was strength in these generations, the three generations of modernism. And, and that strength kind of catapulted this next generation, gave them strength and encouragement to paint the way that they wanted to paint. Right, and then Nina had a follow-up question here, and then we have one more after that. Um, she's curious about whether the Taillere can be compared in any way to the Bauhaus. Wow, that's a great question. Um, the Bauhaus, of course, was a movement in Germany and, and included a lot of the uh, wonderful artists that Walter Gropius, we are very fond of him here in Boston because he was the Dean of the Architectural School. <laughs> Harvard, and he has a house here um, that you can visit. And we also had uh, Joseph Albers, Annie Albers, his wife, who was a wonderful textile artist. Um, and then, of course, World War II comes, and they leave, and they many, many came to the United States. So I think there are some parallels uh, when the Cuban Revolution came uh, to Cuba. A lot of the uh, artists did leave. So we have a, a great number of artists who came to the United States, went to Spain and to other countries, but primarily I would argue United States and Spain, and then were able to contribute uh, their movements and contribute their kind of uh, resistance art from, from afar um, and spread those ideas. So I, I love the idea, Nina. I hadn't really thought of it, but I think there is a lot there. Um, you know, a lot of the uh, Bauhaus students ended up in Black Mountain College in, in North Carolina and contributed to abstraction as we know it today. Um, and so I think some of those same things were happening. They left the Cuban artists, Banguari, the artists that left, came mostly to the United States and Spain and other parts of Latin America and kind of influenced what was happening with abstract expressionism and pop art. And so, you know, I think the important point that we also want to make is that what was happening in Cuba, abstraction was happening in North America, Latin America, and Europe. And so these are all kind of dialogues, if you will, or different dialects of the same, uh, the same language. And then finally, uh, Margaret Connors McQuaid asks, she noticed that many of the works are signed. And she wonders if you know if they were sold as works from Rodriguez de la Cruz's workshop or as individual works by the artists. Thank you, Margaret. I can tell you're a great ceramicist scholar. <laughs> <laughs> um, the important thing I think to take away from that is that we are very fortunate to know that Rodriguez de la Cruz uh, was the proprietor, the physician who actually in 1959 uh, retired from being a doctor and took up ceramic, ceramics full time, which of course is uh, fabulous because uh, he was very busy prior to 1949 and uh, 1959 being a, a physician, but he, somehow he was also able to don his apron and get in there. And he actually molded a lot of these ceramics. So he has signed all of the ceramics that he created and formed, and the women then signed uh, their designs. So when the women throw their own pottery, uh, and it's absent of Rodriguez de la Cruz's um, chop, if you will, artistic chop, then we know that they threw the, that particular piece of pottery and designed it. But when he has signed it, we know it comes from the taller of Santiago de las Vegas. So it's very clearly marked there. All right. Well, um, it remains for me to thank you one more time. And maybe we can have everybody um, 
uh, unmute themselves so you can hear the applause from this oh. one lecture. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so guys. very much. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you for Congrats. coming. And please come and see the show. It's much more spectacular in person. Look forward to seeing all of you. Wait, wait. Muchas gracias. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye. Great job, Elizabeth. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.